Hi guys, welcome to Snakes and Others. I'm going to take beginner keepers or people wanting to get into maybe keeping snakes through some of the basics you need to consider when keeping them. This isn't for the experienced keepers or the ones that are pre-set up. This is, we're going to deal with infrastructure and then maybe go through some checks we can do on the snake before we buy it. Infrastructure is everything that should be in place prior to buying your animal. Impulse buying is never okay. You should avoid it at all costs. This is when mistakes happen, cock-ups are made, things are missed. We haven't considered everything properly and nine times out of ten it is human error that causes us a problem. So baby snakes. Baby snakes can be pretty scared by big enclosures. They, um, it can put them off their food. It can maybe make them slightly more territorial within their tank. Uh, they feel a bit sort of overexposed. And a lot of people grow them on in a beginner tank first, such as a fornarium, also known as geotubs or a pen pal, um, to grow your snakes on. A noteworthy of ma being made is this is really only for the temperate colubrids. Colubrids would cover king snakes, milk snakes, bull snakes, pine snakes, gopher snakes. Because it's got an open lid, we're going to heat it with a heat pad or under underfloor heater, um, and it's going to warm a surface underneath the cave to around 30 degrees. It's not suitable for boas or pythons, which are generally within the tropics and require a higher temperature and also higher humidity. Humidity being very difficult to get with the mesh top lid. Another option is going to be to use a really useful box, which you can get from craft centers or staples. They're available in a myriad of different sizes, and you can maybe grow your baby snake on in there. I don't necessarily recommend, certainly for beginners, keeping them in rubs all their life or really useful boxes. One, they look shit. Um, they don't have really any aesthetic value whatsoever. You are a pet keeper, you want to have your animal on display, and you want it to be a feature within your room. Um, it's breeders that use rubs and because you're a beginner and it's your first snake you're not a breeder yet don't emulate them try and be a pet keeper first enjoy your animals and enjoy the spectacle that you can create so as your animal grows and matures we're going to go up into a vivarium or we could use a terrarium um, and we would then construct a tank using basic principles. Now these principles would still apply to our baby uh, starter kit but would all be obviously be smaller scale. Generally we're going to have two hides, one at the warm end, one at the cold end. This allows your animal to thermoregulate and move between the two hides without necessarily being exposed. If we only had one hide in at the cold end, the animal would permanently stay at the cold end, particularly if it felt threatened or scared. And this would mean then that potentially there's a higher risk of catching cold or respiratory infections. Alternatively, if we remove the other, it permanently stays at the warm end, does not necessarily come out to have a drink, or to roam around its tank and thermoregulate correctly. This could lead to constipation, could lead to bad sheds. So we always offer multiple hide sites within a vivarium. This is just standard care. And again, in the starter kit, it's just smaller scale, but the same principle applies. Your water bowl always goes down the cool end and you want to try and keep it as fresh as possible. Your animal does not enjoy drinking warm water, so we'll try and keep that nice and fresh. We're going to decide on a substrate, which is our ground uh, material, what we're going to use. There's a few different options. So we could use lignocell, we could use orchid bark, or we could use beach chippings. So these are just three examples. There are others out there, but these are probably the three most common. Lignocell and beach, this one and this one. These are more for the dry animals. The orchid bark is for the subtropical or tropical animals. The only animal that really would be classed as a beginner species that would sit on this would maybe either be a spotted python or a royal python. Pretty much everything else that would be on a beginner list would go onto these lighter colored substrates. We only need a small scattering down. It's there to basically catch the detritus, the fecal material, the urates, and we can clean it out and replace it. Um, by spot checking and then probably once every month to six weeks we're going to fully clean it out make sure that the tank is nice and clean for the animal also what we're going to do is then discuss how we heat a tank how we maintain temperature um, this is all important stuff you know um, the heat source can be it, it differs depending on the animal that you're going to use so this is a heat pad this is the sort of thing we're putting underneath our start kit for smaller body bodied colubrids, animals that may be underneath a meter in length, this will suffice. And we can use something called a thermostat, which you'll hear a lot of in this video. The thermostats are all important. These guys are the ones that decide what the temperature is inside the tank. They either turn off or 
um, dim or pulse to maintain the temperature within the tank. These heat sources, if unbridled, will get too hot. So, as a beginner setting out and not fully understanding how to create a tank where maybe a thermostat isn't used, which generally is extra large zoo type enclosures, uh, we're going to be using a stack always. In fact, we have a thermostat policy at Snakes and Adders. You can't purchase the animal unless you've got one. So, that's how seriously we take it. So, the underpad heater is the most basic option. Um, some people would frown upon that, they don't necessarily like it, they prefer the idea of top heat, more naturalistic, um, so, you know, um, something that acts like the sun, warms up the surface, they would bask on it, and also warms up the air, and we would have no argument with that, the single best way to heat an enclosure with is, an, is with an overhead heater, they can take different forms, the most cost effective form, in the short term anyway, are spotlights. So we can use whether they come in green, clear, red, but bear in mind that you need to provide heat at night. So generally if you're using a thermostat, maybe one of the more advanced units, such as like this Evo light, they, oh sorry, Evo will control the daytime high and a nighttime low, which means that your heat source will be running throughout the night. So you can't really use a clear bulb in that situation because obviously then the animal thinks it's daylight all the time. They have the same circadian rhythms that we do, so at which point they need to think it's day and when it's night with the heat. Obviously the ambient light in the room floods in as well as uh, the, the spot bulb colour. And obviously tells them it's daytime when to be active and increase in temperature etc etc. So yeah we don't use clear bulbs at night. There are other options <coughs> apart from the spot bulb. We can use something called a ceramic heat emitter or CHE which you'll see them referred to online. Or there's a new product out which is called the Deep Heat Projector from Arcadia, which essentially is a non-light emitting heat source. They may give off a gentle glow, but that's about it. They would never be uh, sufficient for lighting up an enclosure. Um, both of those are a lot more expensive, but you do get a vastly longer life out of these units. Um, the ceramic heat emitters are rated for 10,000 hours. And as far as I'm aware, the deep heat projector from the manufacturer um, is saying that the lifespan should be around five years. To put that in perspective, the spotlights on the market, doesn't matter where they're made, uh, they are going to be rated for a thousand hours. There are some halogen solutions out there which get slightly hotter and they also last longer. They're on a 2000 hour cycle, but I've never really seen coloured versions of those available, only ever clear. Um, so, yeah, not really if we're going to be using our bulbs, our primary heat source 24 hours a day, we can't use the clear bulbs. Um, make sure that any heat source you have is guarded and protected, so we're going to put a, a cage around it. Uh, snakes are stupid and will permanently investigate their tank, including touching their snout against the bulb, which potentially could burn them. So we're going to cage it to make sure that they're safe and that they're not going to come to any harm. So when we're using our thermostats, we also need to have a thermometer in there, which is going to tell us uh, and display a temperature where we can measure the basking site. The probe for the thermostat never ever goes at the basking site itself. The risk is that your animal lays on top of the probe, gives a false reading and makes the thermostat turn up. So your thermostat will always be mounted on a side wall or a back wall, roughly four to six inches off the floor. And this then means that it reports back to the thermostat box, tells it what the temperature is. We use the probe from our thermometer at the basking site and we use that to set our thermostat. So depending on the species, whether we want 28, 30, 32, 34 degrees Celsius, obviously the research for your species specific stuff will tell you what temperature you need, what parameters you need within the vivarium. Also, a vivlock. Good security, we want to make sure that also if we've got young kids in the house, they're not getting in when we don't want them to. And equally that the animals aren't escaping and that we've had to go through the motion of locking the tank to know that we shut the doors. And we haven't accidentally left one ajar for somebody to escape, heartbreak to ensue and all the rest of it. Because snakes are very good at disappearing and not so good at coming back. Uh, so yeah, we'll make sure that the animals are nice and secure as well. So... That's your basic rig, that's how you're going to go through it. We'll have the warm hide, the cold hide water bowl, the substrate spread on the floor, maybe a couple of plants. 
it, it doesn't need to be a work of art, but it needs to be functional. It needs to hit these basics, which are warm, high, cold, high water, a heat source that is controlled to the correct temperature, and a cool end that they can escape to and move between to control their body temperature. As long as we hit those goals, your animal should be fine. You can obviously go as extreme as you like, um, and there's a lot of people now going into the bioactive stuff. This tends to be a bit more of an uh, involved process, not something that a beginner necessarily should do. Maybe we should concentrate more as a beginner on raising our animal, get it feeding right, making sure it's strong and healthy before we consider some of these more sort of involved types of husbandry. You can get to that at a later date, and there's absolutely no reason why not. Uh, you can create fabulous and uh, naturalistic enclosures that look the nuts. Um, but yeah, let's just concentrate on the animal and the husbandry basics of the animal first. So you've come to the shop, you've got your vivarium. You have also, before buying the animal, researched where your local veterinary specialist is. A lot of vets will see reptiles. They do not necessarily know about reptiles. They may have read about them in a book or done a semester on them at university. They are not necessarily specialists. And it is important that you find a vet that is well versed in reptilian medicine before by purchasing your pet to make sure that we can obviously have somewhere where we can go if we've got problems. First port of call is usually your local specialist or a breeder friend or someone to ask advice. But if it goes beyond topical care, which is everything on the outside where we can do little basics or checking the environment, etc., to make sure there's been no human errors, at some point you may need to visit the vet. So it's important that you've got that part of your infrastructure in place as well. So you've come to get your snake. This is a striped uh, butter corn snake. This is a, a young adult male. So I'm considering purchasing this snake. What checks should I go through to ensure that I'm buying a healthy animal? So we'll start at the front. Let's check his face. As I'm holding the snake and he's crawling through my hands, I'm paying special attention to first his mouth to make sure that it's clean and it sits together neatly. There's no sagging or dropping of the jaws. There's no inflammation or puffiness. Everything sits as it should. The jaw isn't ajar and everything is lined up and looks neat. There's no discoloration, no discharge, no buildup of any what we call cassius or cheesy material, which could show us that potentially maybe there's a case of mouth rot or some other problem inside. His tongue is flicking regularly and the forks of his tongue are apart. There's no bubbles and no um, mucus coming from the, the uh, rostral notch where the tongue comes. I'm also going to listen to the way that he breathes. I want to hear any clicks or pops or wheezing. I'm going to check his lower throat and make sure that that's not blowing out like a frog, ribbit, ribbit, ribbit as he breathes, which also shows us that potentially maybe there could be a pneumonia or respiratory infection going on. As I move down the body, I'm going to look at general body shape, body mass, I neither want an obese snake nor an underweight snake. I do not want to buy a Toblerone and I don't want to buy something that's huge and fat. So generally with the corn snakes and a lot of the other colubrids, their body shape cross section should look like a loaf of bread, relatively tall sides, a rounded top and a flat bottom. Uh, the flat bottom is what helps them to climb, so they'll always have an edge to this lower ventral scale. I'm also going to look and make sure that the spine isn't exposed. There should be a gentle dint on the back because we've got two fillets of muscle running down the back of the spine. So the spine should be a hollow on the back. If it's protruding, this is a problem. Your animal doesn't have enough body weight. So we're not going to consider this animal. What we're also going to do is take the opportunity to run our hand down the snake a few times. We're feeling for a few things here, chief amongst which is any lumps, bumps, kinks, deviations or problems with the spine. Kinks can be problematic um, because the lump that you get on the outside you also get on the inside and as the animal grows or develops this could cause blockages and other problems. It could be a sign of inbreeding or it could have been trapped at some point when it's tried to escape a vivarium uh, or it's just a congenital defect it was born with and um, generally we're going to try and avoid those because it could be a precursor to other congenital problems that it's been born with as well. Enlarged liver, shrunken heart, etc. So this snake's got a lovely smooth spine, that's great. Whilst I'm also running my hand down its body, I'm going to be checking my uh, palm and I'm going to try and see if there's any little black insects running around on my hand. And these are mites. 
black fleas on a dog, they're relatively commonplace, but you don't want to inherit a snake with mites, so you're always going to do that check first. Um, it can be treated, it's not the end of the world, but you would never knowingly or wantonly buy an animal that's got a mite infection. Next job is we check the vent, which is an enlarged scale. It's usually a split scale, and we can see it there. So the vent is bum. Uh, we want to make sure that it's not discoloured in any way, there's no staining, there's no problems here, that the scale sits flat, that there's no issues, it's not protruding, it's not stood up, um, because we don't want there to be any gastrointestinal problems, uh, internal parasites, worms, and etc. So we'll check this. The good thing is, nearly all of the snakes that you'd be buying as a beginner uh, are captive bred, so the likelihood of them having these sort of parasitic burdens is low, but I want you to go through the checks anyway. We're going to check the tail tip. We're going to make sure that there's no previous shed skins built up. It's incredibly common for shed skins to stick on the end of the tail. Now, if they build up, eventually they nip off the blood supply and they will kill the end of the tail and the tail will fall off where it will turn black, then it will fall off. It could lead to secondary infection. So we're just going to make sure that that tail's nice and neat and whole. There's no spare shed skin. We'll also just look at the eyes. We want to make sure that the eyes are crystal clear and bright that there's no evidence of any previous sheds being left there. The brill is an enlarged scale that covers the eyeball and that can sometimes get stuck or it's difficult to remove for the snake. So they'll shed the rest of the skin but leave the eye socket on. Over time this can cause problems, can discolour, it can crack, it can cause infections. So we're going to make sure that we've got crystal clear eyes as well. So I hope that that was a useful introduction to just basically the basic checks the infrastructure, the bits and pieces you may need for your animal. Um, there's a lot more to consider yet. There's the feeding and all the rest of it, which we'll go through in other videos. But this is just to appraise you of the basics before you get your snake, of how you're going to go about it, the order in which you want to do it. Uh, come and see people like me or Paul, and we will help you any way we can. Uh, we are grumpy, but we are minds of information, and we will help you. And it's always nice to get people willing to do the research first. It makes a refreshing change. Um, keep watching the videos. Visit www.snakesandadders.co.uk to see what we're all about. Cheers.